The Wheat School on realagriculture.com is brought to you by Alberta Grains, CNM Seeds, and Syngenta Canada. Find more episodes of The Wheat School by going to wheatschool.com. Hi, I'm Amber Bell, and this is Real Agriculture. I am here today with Dr. Brianne Tideman, and we're going to be doing a wheat school talking about herbicide resistance. So welcome. It is wonderful to have you today. Thanks for having me. So we just finished up a meeting with Alberta Grains. We did. And you were sitting on a panel talking about exactly that, herbicide resistance. You bet. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about the background and why this is important to growers. Yeah. So we're, we're seeing herbicide resistance become more and more of a problem. Um, it's something that develops over time. Mm -hmm. um, and so as we spend more and more years applying herbicides, we start to see more and more herbicide resistance. Obviously that it impacts the grower's bottom line in terms of you know loss of yield from those weeds being in there and, and increased costs from trying to manage those weeds and it just becomes a significant issue. Right, and what are some of the weeds that are most apparent? I know today they're talking about wild oats. Yeah, so the, the two sort of big ticket items, I guess, when it comes to resistant weeds would be wild oat and kochia. Um, there's a number of other weeds with resistance. We've got um, glyphosate resistant downy brome, we've got group two resistant broadleaves, a number of them, uh, hemp nettle and wild mustard and all those kinds of things. There's, there's a lot of different types of resistance out there. The ones that cause the most issues for growers on farm right now would be wild oat resistance to group one and two herbicides mm -hmm. and kosher resistance to it seems like everything. Right. And so what are you recommending to growers to deal with it? Because I mean, herbicides that takes out a big yeah. portion of their toolbox, right? Yeah. I mean, we're, we're not saying that you can't spray herbicides at all anymore. There's, there's still herbicide products that are effective. If you're using herbicides, you know, tank mixing them, making sure you have more than one effective mode of action wherever possible. We recognize that with resistance that becomes very challenging sometimes, but where possible, using more than one mode of action. Uh, and sometimes that's not even in the same tank as a tank mix, but sometimes that's a layering process where you put uh, a preceding product on that has some residual and then follow it up with an in-crop to help manage what the precede didn't capture, those kinds of things as well. Um, but then also diversifying that management strategy, um, looking at non-chemical techniques, whether you're focusing on your crop and doing things like increasing your seeding rate, diversifying your crop rotation, adding in some perennials or an, an early cut silage crop or a winter cereal if you're in a region where you can do that, um, those types of strategies. Or if you're more into something physical, you know, incorporating a, a seed impact mill or a seed destructor, weed seed destructor is, is often how folks refer to them, um, something like that. There, there are other tactics out there, but it does take time, effort and, and money to, to, to start them. incorporating them. Right. Yeah. And so you spoke about seeding rate, yeah. and I think that's one that a lot of growers don't really consider when they're thinking about herbicide resistance, right? So yeah. can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, it's it's one that seems to, to surprise some growers, not all, but um, one thing that we just see, it's if you increase that seeding rate, you provide more crop competition against the weed. The weed has to work harder to have the same level of success. Um, and so by increasing that seeding rate, especially in your crops like cereals where you might be running bin run seed um, or certified seed that maybe doesn't have that same level of input cost as some of our other crops, it's a really great opportunity to increase that seeding rate. Um, you know, we. I'm a researcher, we work in seeds per square meter. Often in our cereals, we're in like the 400 seeds per square meter range, which would be like 40 seeds per square foot approximately, so. Right, yeah. Right. And you're seeing that that makes a big difference. Like what about economically? Because I guess that would be the other argument against it, right? Well, I, I guess it's a, a question of where do you want to spend your funds? You know, mm -hmm. I've, I've had growers say, I'm spending up to 60 bucks an acre on wild oat herbicides. That's a lot of money where are you still getting, are you getting complete control of those wild oats? Right. Maybe not. Um, and so by increasing your seeding rate, yeah, there's an added cost, but if you can cut your herbicide applications down substantially too, and those herbicides last longer for right. more years, that might be a beneficial trade-off. And then you have a potential bigger yield as well. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, I, there was one grower in the meeting with us there today that, that said he had read 
you know, something about seeding right from my predecessor, uh, Neil Harker at Ag Canada, and decided to try it on his farm and, and was shocked at the impact that it had compared to, you know, trying all the herbicide products that just increasing the seeding rate made a huge difference on his wild oat populations. So, wow, that's incredible. Yeah. And can you speak into a little bit of why we might be seeing more herbicide resistance today as opposed to 50 years ago? Yeah, so uh, herbicide resistance is essentially, it's, it's evolution on a time scale that we can see. Mm -hmm. um, and so when you apply a herbicide to a population, what we're essentially seeing is the survival of that one individual that has a genetic mutation or genetic change that allows it to survive. That one then will reproduce seed and it becomes a slightly bigger portion of your population. And so over time, you see those individuals take up more of a proportion of your population. Um, but it's also resistance is just flat out it's a numbers game it's a game mm -hmm. of probability so the more weeds you're applying herbicides to the more acres you're applying herbicides to the longer time span that you're applying herbicides the more selection pressure you're putting on the more likely you are to find those individuals that are resistant right right um do you have any words of encouragement for growers that are kind of thinking about their next growing season and might be making plans for how to manage you know, I, I think thinking about weed management as a management plan, it's not just what herbicides are you going to spray, it's what crops are you growing, how are you going to give those crops that competitive advantage, is that a seeding rate, is that a crop type, mm -hmm. you know, if, if you have a field that is really a weed issue, maybe you grow barley instead of wheat, it's a cereal phase of your rotation, but maybe you flip to barley, because barley's more competitive. Um, We've got ongoing research trying to provide producers the ability to select varieties that are more competitive. I've irritated myself for years in integrated weed management talks saying, grow a competitive variety and farmers go, great, how do I know which ones are competitive? And I say, you don't. It's not information that's available to you, but it's a good strategy. Right. And there's certain characteristics that we know tend to make a, a variety more competitive, you know, mm -hmm. an earlier maturing or a taller variety or an early vigor. Like we know that those are beneficial. But there's not actually a ranking that says, you know, this variety is this competitive, is this use. is not mm -hmm. in comparison. So we're trying to develop a way that we could actually develop a ranking of some kind so producers could incorporate that. But, you know, if, if you have a mixed farm, if you can incorporate a field that's a 2x seeding rate of your, your normal for barley with an early cut barley silage, that can be incredibly helpful for managing wild oats because you're cutting those wild oats before they produce seed. Right. Right. And management of weeds is not just what you see on the surface, but it's also managing that entire history the of that weed in and, the seed bank. Mm -hmm. Right. It's that that weed has has deposited and saved a huge amount of its population in that seed bank. It's, it's a bank for a reason. Right. Yeah. And so if you're only managing what you see on the top and not those seeds that are being produced, you, you've got a whole bank there that can just keep coming up year after year until you deal with that as well. Right. So you have to start, start looking at that whole life cycle, not just the seedlings, but those that survive my herbicide, if I let them go to seed, all I'm doing is replenishing the population for next year with my resistant ones. Right, right. And so just really integrating all of those tools together. Yeah. So no magic bullets? There are no magic bullets. Uh, I have a colleague at North Dakota State University, Joe Eichley, um, who is one of the co-hosts of the War Against Weeds podcast, so a little shout out there as well. Uh, but the tagline of their podcast is, silver bullets are for werewolves, not weeds. And it hits home so thoroughly that, you know, I, I get asked, what's the solution to herbicide resistance? And I'm not researching solutions. I'm researching right. management tools and options. Mm -hmm. They're not going to solve resistance. They're not going to solve the resistance issues, but they're another tool to manage those weeds. There's no silver bullets. Those are for werewolves. Right. <laughs> well, that was amazing. Thank you so much for the information. And that was Dr. Brianne Tideman on Real Agriculture.